You know we came to give you good news today. <laughs> and that is that it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Give it to you. We were all taught, you know, years ago and right up to the present day, what is what is grace, God's grace to us. And we've been taught it's his unmerited favor. And the different versions of our Bible tell us that. It's uh, God's unmerited favor. So what we put the emphasis on is the unmerited. And we've said, oh, we don't deserve it and and uh, our, our flesh takes over, and oh, our spirit is so devoid of the things of God, we can't comprehend. We want to, and yet our flesh takes over, and it keeps us from going in the spirit. Did you know that? It keeps you from going in the spirit and living in the spirit. But you have to remember this. Forget about the unmerited now. We know we don't deserve anything. But remember, grace is favor. Grace is favor. God's given you favor. That's part of the good news of the gospel. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you enter into getting his good pleasure. And his good pleasure is his grace to you, and that is favor. You're favorable in his sight. He favors you above anything else. He's given you favor when you come to him. And I want to read you something out of Romans 8 that will set the tone for the things that we have to tell you today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans 8. I have just a couple verses. I have the Amplified Bible that I'm going to read out of today. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Everybody wants to be led by the Spirit. Everybody wants to do God's perfect will. Everybody wants to have God rule their lives for them. But there are uh, premises that have to be established first. And once we do that, we have God's favor, then we're going to realize in the 12th verse in the Amplified, Paul out in your version too. Paul is saying here, So then, brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. We are not obligated to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dictates of the flesh. You know your flesh dictates to you? It's, the flesh is given to you to live in this world. You know that. You've got a body that we can feel and admire and look at and say, oh, that's a beautiful person. We can see the clothes. We can see the person that has a body. We can feel it and touch it. We can't see the spirit, and that's what God sees, because he's a spirit. And he wants to infiltrate our spirit and take that over with his. But how can he do it? When we are led by the dictates of our flesh, he can't. We have to give that over to him. See, if God can do anything, but when our will is involved, then he has to stop there. So we want you to know, before we tell you, the things we're going to tell you today, keep this in your mind this afternoon. I would like to have you repeat this after me. If you, if you want God's will in your life, and that includes everybody here. Just repeat this after me. Let's close our eyes and say it unto the Father. Father, I thank you for Jesus, my Savior. I want my will to be conformed to your will. From this moment forward, I will not allow the dictates of my flesh to overcome my spirit. But I give my spirit to you now by my own free will. Take over and use me, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. The rest of Romans 8 goes on to tell about the, the perfect will of God. And you know, all things work together for good. We're going to tell you the good that works together. To those that love God, let him control that fleshly nature and that are called according to his purpose. And his purpose is to give you favor in his sight that he could have good pleasure. God wants to have good pleasure. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, oh.
we're gathered together here, and as we talk about intercessory prayer, intercession, it's necessary for us to realize that we stand in the same place as the people did back on the day of Pentecost. Just before Jesus was going to the cross, he told his disciples, he says, it's needful for you that I go away, because if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will not come. It was needful for Jesus to go away that the Comforter would come. And if it was needful for these men on the day of Pentecost, the apostles, to walk in that dimension of the Holy Spirit, it's needful for us to have the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And the Holy Spirit will come. He will come and indwell us. But you know, many people come and receive the Holy Spirit and there's all the joy, all the ecstasy, and they like what they call feeling, all, all the feeling, the enjoyment of it. But you have only walked through a door when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, and you move into a, you've moved into a new dimension. There's power in your life. If you do not use it, you're going to be frustrated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You may not realize that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I do not really like to say I feel this or that. I like to say I sense. Mm -hmm. You sense the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can sense when angels come into your presence and stand by you. You sense it. You know they're, You know when they come. I serve. I I saw them. I've never expected in my life that I should stand in a place such as this. But the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me and showing me things. And there are things unfolding even today over the last few days. Mm -hmm. We have shared experiences with you, but there are those that are in, they're in progress right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh my, yes. I wish I could tell you. Fern, she'd, she'd love to tell you. But you know, she has to be a good girl and not say anything. Because you cannot get in the way of what God is doing. See, I went through experiences years ago. God would show me things in the spirit. And I knew so much about it that I would go to people about it. But that wasn't the thing to do. Don't go unless God tells you to go. And don't tell everything that God tells you. Oh my. You, you, yeah, so, so, so. Hallelujah. Yesterday, as we were ministering here, and I said, I was praying in the Holy Spirit. Why, uh, you know, you, you, you pray in many languages. And as I came into the morning service, uh, Brother Tom came up and he said, that There are some people here yesterday, they heard you praying in the the Danish language. And uh, he said, that, would you like to hear what you were praying about? And I said, yes, I would like to hear. So he went in and got this couple. And they came out and they said, you were praying in the Danish language about that Jesus is coming soon. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you see, there's even more to it than that. In the last few months, wherever I seem to go in services, I pray this in different languages. And people come to me and they tell me the same thing. I am amazed that the God, the creator of the whole earth, will come and he's concerned that I know that his coming is near. But I also understand. It's an awesome place to begin to realize God is speaking to me and he's saying, don't get involved in too many other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm 
Be very careful what you do. You see, I have known of the Holy Spirit since I was just a little fellow. And I just share a little bit about that. We had a pastor, he, a very ungodly man, a drunkard, lived in Chicago. God saved him wondrously, came to our community, spoke about half Swedish and about half English. But anointed of God, oh, anointed. And back in the early days of Pentecost, it's different than today. Oh, that was this one. These men walked in a great dimension in the gifts of the Spirit. You see, you didn't have telephones. You didn't have radios. And I lived up in Wisconsin. And the, the only way these pastors would know when people were in a need was when God spoke to their spirit. They would come through blizzards and snowstorms. The pastor would come into our house, and we lived on, on a more of thoroughfare where we could get through, and he'd come with my mother and father and say, we got to go over and see so-and-so. God's, I, I got such a burden for him, we got to go over there and minister. And as a young boy, I did much skiing, and I'd go out, and I knew the countryside, and in a blizzard I could go. I knew all the fence lines. I knew the trees. And you know, it's very dangerous to go out in a snow blizzard if you don't know what you're doing. And I can remember as a young fellow going with them through the deep snow, taking them, leading them through the storm. Coming to these houses that are isolated. An old couple in the house. And something had happened to the man. This, I, I don't know, an attack of Satan or what, but he lost control of himself. The lady having a very, his wife having a very difficult time to take care of him. And they came and they ministered. The cattle hadn't been milked. The chickens hadn't been fed. All the, po uh, all the, all the cattle needed feed, water. In the wintertime, it's cold. They must be taken care of. God's concerned about all these things. But I saw this in so many ways. I did, I, all I observed, I saw what God was doing. And I knew this Holy Spirit was wonderful. But these people that walked in that day, they looked for the coming of the Lord. Every day they go out and they look up. And you see, God speaking to us as he's coming soon. And he's coming, he's going for those who look for him. And that's what God is saying to us. He's coming, we must be looking for him. Things we're sharing in the Holy Spirit with you is, is intercession, and God is wanting this to be birthed in God's in His church in all the fellowships. A flowing of the Spirit. So, oh yes, yes, that is so. Yeah, yeah. Eliezer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see, Eliezer was Abraham's servant. And you know, he, Abraham didn't have any heir. And he cried out before the Lord and he says, Do I have to leave everything to Eliezer? Well, you know the story how Abraham, how Isaac was born. But as Isaac grew up, Abraham sent Eliezer out, his servant, to go back into the land where he came from and to get a bride for Isaac. Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. He's going out, he's searching for the bride. And he's got gifts. Eliezer, the Holy Spirit's here today. And there's, 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 there's so many things. You see, even gifts must be. The Holy Spirit wants to give out gifts. The intercessors are going to move. They've been moving in intercession, but it must be greater. We have walked in dimensions, and we'll be sharing stories with you. They're only to give you a little understanding when these things happen. For you see, I moved in so many of them and knew nothing about it. No teaching on it much. My pastor would say, 
I, it's of God, but he says, I've never had these experiences. But he says, I know it is of God. Because I remember one day at work, I became very burdened to pray. And I realized I must pray. And being I was in charge of my department, I could arrange to take time off on vacation. It was in the morning hours. And so I arranged to be gone for the rest of the day on my vacation time. I called the pastor. I, must, I knew I had to pray with him. I knew that. You see, you move by the impression. There's impression within your spirit. But then there's also the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so close to know him. And then these, that these gifts come into operation that you begin to know things in this area. And I knew I must pray because I've been praying about uh, my nation for many times. I pray about our nation, international things, the UN, men by name, the thoughts and intents of their heart. You know them. Ah, so, oh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. For you see, we walk in the spirit and, and it, we move in that thing that would bring forth God's purpose and plan. See, that's what we intercede for, to bring forth what is in his heart. Ministries. Yeah, oh, yeah, we, they, oh, yeah, the ministries have to come forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so. Uh, uh, so I, we, we begin to pray with our pastor, and I begin to intercede. And, oh, I begin to intercede. And I begin to intercede for a man by the name of Gordon Cooper. And I begin to pray about these satellites. This was back in the days when the Russians had just shot up their first Sputnik. And they were shooting these things down through the Caribbean, just, you know, for several hundred miles. But I had such a burden, and I began to pray for my nation. And, you know, you know things and learn things through the Holy Spirit that you don't know in other ways. Such a warfare against what the Russians were doing. I was lifting my nation up. I was pleading the cost of my nation yes. before God. Yes, yes. Well, hallelujah. Our nation could not go down. It could not go down. And I interceded for this shot going down through the Atlantic. We prayed all afternoon. And near the supper hour, there was a release in the spirit. It was taken care of. I went home. And as we were having the, we had supper together. The pastor called me and he says, Phil, he says, now I know what we were praying about. It shot this spaceship down through the Caribbean out over the Atlantic. And it had come down, but it had missed the mark several hundred miles from where it was supposed to be. They thought they had lost him. Gordon Cooper was the pilot on him. But you know, after several hours, they found him and they rescued him. But you know, he would have been lost if someone hadn't interceded. When these things go out in space, it's like your spirit goes with them. You know things that are going to happen and you pray. The scripture says we're to pray for our nation. But do, you know, in Romans 8, 26, it says we don't know how to pray. You're going to have to pray in the spirit. And let that intercession come forth where you begin to pray what's in the mind of the Father. For he knows all things. The future is in his hand. But in this world, we move and we have authority as we move in this domain. You see, Adam turned this world over to Satan. And Satan is the God of this world. But praise God, when we're born again and we live here, we have a right to ask God to come down here and intervene in our behalf. In intercession, you take the place of another and you intercede in the behalf of another one before the throne of the Lord. Secret to intercessory prayer is other people. Pray for other people. Galatians 6, 2, we read that yesterday. If you want the blessing of God on you, forget about yourself and concentrate on him. Now, how do we concentrate on Jesus? We concentrate on the person that's in prison. We visit Jesus in prison. Have you ever been in a prison? We hadn't for many years until somebody was there and asked us to come, wrote to us and asked us to come. That was a revelation. 
and we knew God wanted us to be there. And what a blessing it is. Uh, feeding the hungry. We've had so many experiences over the years. Of course, we don't have to go back 40 years or 30 years or 20 years. We can do that. We want to take you right up to now. Things are happening right now that we can tell you about later. But we want to tell you about something happened just a couple weeks ago. A little aside. We've been praying. Remember, uh, the Holy Spirit has been bringing forth. Bringing forth. Now remember, it's the Holy Spirit. It isn't us. We're pipelines. Want to be a pipeline? The pipeline gets blessed for what flows through it. Amen. Okay. Amen. But there's true. a lot of things can flow through it. You know, we talk about the desires of the flesh. When that fall, when that flows through, there's no room for the Spirit. That fills it up. To get rid of that, you know how to get rid of that. In your will. Then let the Holy Spirit. Let your will be set on that, and He will do with you. Whatever your makeup and personality is, whatever your ministry is. Now, there's no such thing as full-time ministry. I don't believe that. We're all in a full-time ministry. See, we we don't we don't have a ministry. We came to serve you. We could be home eating cookies. You know, we could have our feet up on the sofa and looking at pictures. But see, the Holy Spirit has put a desire in our heart to help you. And so that's the only reason we're here. The only reason we're up here and you're down there, as we said yesterday, is because we have a microphone so that you can hear this. You're the same as us. There is no difference. We're not any better. We're not any worse. We're all the same before God, and he loves you and wants to give you this. We were in a grocery store about, what's about a month ago now, and uh, we came out of there with uh, two sacks of groceries. We were just checking out and coming out. And um, just as we were going out the door of the supermarket, uh, I said to my husband, did you notice that couple right behind you? And he turned around, and he looked at him, and I, we went outside the door, and I said, look it, there's a young man, looks like he's probably about 30, very slender, and his young Filipino wife, a very beautiful girl, and a baby, I'd say, about six, eight months old, and little thin jackets. It was a very cold day. And what they had in their cart, when I really turned around and looked at them, they had a loaf of bread, and a quart of milk, and look like a package of bologna or sliced meat. And I said to my husband, oh, I said, just like we got two sacks of groceries. And I said, those people are in trouble. I, I, I can't eat my food. <laughs> you know, I can't go home and have my food. And no, somebody's out there that doesn't have food that I can help. There's a lot of people I can't help. Heaven knows that. God knows our heart, but if you are concerned, if the compassion in your heart takes over, it'll it'll just direct to these people. They just come across your path. It's not all before a crowd of people at all. Oh, get that through the brain center here, because your spirit, when that takes over, you minister in your block. You have things to do where God sets you with your neighbors that the rest of us aren't there. We'll, we'll go into some of these things. We, the Lord impressed us things to tell you today. Well, we saw the couple, and uh, we went back in the store, and we went over by the windows, and uh, my husband didn't have much money with him, but he folded up. He took a $20 bill and folded it up, and he went over to the young man. And I inquired, and I said, well, I said, young man, I said, Are, do you have work now? He says, no. He said, I'm, I'm out of a job. He said, we came down from Indiana about seven months ago. And uh, he said, in November, I was laid off, and I haven't had work since that time. And I said, well, I said, I would just like to give you this. I said, as if I may do that. And he looked at me and said, did you, did you see me use food, food stamps? I said, no. I said, I, was, I walked out ahead of you, and I said, I noticed your little boy, and he caught my eye. And the, because years ago, I had a little fellow, and I just kind of loved him. And I said, I just wanted to just felt I wanted to come and give this to you. And I said, I would like to, if I may, I, I said, I'd like to pray with you that the Lord would give you a job. And he looked at me, he says, this is very unusual, he says, but he says, if it pleases you, he says, oh, go ahead and do it. I said, it pleases me to do it. Um, so I prayed with him that the Lord would give him work. And while I was talking with the young man, Fern had gone over and was talking with his wife. Yeah, I asked the 
her phone number, and I, at that stage, I want to give her ours. I gave it to her later, but I want to give her our number right away, so I really kind of knew her a little bit. And uh, I got her telephone number, and uh, when we came outside the store now, I, I should have prefaced this whole story by telling you for several, uh, or not several weeks, a year or more, the Holy Spirit, every once in a while, the name Justin would come into our prayers. So you you kind of get the drift of what I'm telling you now. Justin, and we don't know anybody by the name of Justin in our immediate circumstance, uh, but this name had kept coming every once in a while. It would just come forth. I got her phone number, and I said, well, we'd like to have you folks come over sometime. I didn't want to say, oh, you know, come over home with me. Now we'd give them a chance to think what had happened. And it was Friday. We uh, tried to get them when we came home well, after a couple hours, and the phone just rang, and the operator answered and said, uh, um, uh, you can't reach that number. And I said, oh, Philip, they couldn't pay the phone bill. So, of course, they were too proud to tell us we can't reach them. What do we do? We have no idea where they live in Owasso outside of Tulsa. So we decided that Monday morning we'd call the phone company and we hid their name and we'd find out what the phone bill was and we would pay the phone bill in order to reach these people. We knew we could do that. And then we would have, you see, there's a will, there's a will, there is a way. So don't excuse yourself if there's no way, because you know Jesus is the way, and he said he'd be in us, and so you're the way. You know those dollars you got tucked away? He wants you to start distributing them. That time you got for yourself, he wants you to kind of keep spreading that around, because he's going to just overload you with gifts and blessings. So Monday morning, first thing we got up, we were worshiping the Lord. Before we had breakfast, we called information, and I said to her, we'd like to find out this name, and we don't know where they live, but here's the phone number. Can you check that and tell us what their bill would be? Because we want, want to pay that. And she says, did you dial a one first? I said, well, no, I didn't. She broke it. Dial a one, you'll get it. And I did. She answered the phone. <laughs> so... I said, she sounded very cheerful. I told her who I was, and uh, she, yes, she remembered me, and she said, well, sounded very happy. And I said, how's everything going with you? And Phil was there, wanted to talk to her husband. She says, oh, he just left for a job appointment. He had an appointment for an interview. And I said, oh, wonderful. Do you remember in the grocery store that my husband prayed with your husband that God would give him a job? And she just murmured something like, uh, yeah, you know. It was strange to her. I didn't take it as a negative thing, and even if she had been negative, it wouldn't have bothered me at all. I was not in, I'm not influenced, and you're not influenced by the response. It's only God that we please. Is that? Yeah. So I said, would your husband call us later when he uh, comes home from the job interview and, uh, and talk to my husband? She said, yes, he will. Later that night, he called to tell us that he'd gotten a job. Now, the point of the story is that when we asked, what is your little baby's name, the baby's name was Justin. <laughs> so, see, God had a purpose all the time. We didn't know what it was. You don't have to know. That filters through the brain center, and it's not necessary. You hear it, and just let God take that. See, if you're, or, or maybe, maybe you won't get a name in prayer like we do. You don't have to, but you'll get an impression. You meet them, you get an impression to help them or, or, you know, do something nice for them. Make up your mind every day you're going to look for an opportunity to do something good to somebody else. You'll find them all over the place. Then that opens the channel so God can do something. Uh, when he called that evening, he says, I want to tell you what I did with the money. Mm -hmm. He says, we went over to the store and we bought a coat for our little boy. He didn't have a coat. Yeah. There was snow outside. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was good. It was good. God loves children, and I could tell you many stories many about stories. little children, mm -hmm. how I have interceded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Children that have been abandoned. Mm -hmm. God loves them. He mm -hmm. knows where they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't know how much God is to how, how what a great love Does he has she for da, ba, 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 ba. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's Hallelujah. 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 H
If you have in mind a public ministry, like you think we do, forget it. If it's of God, it will come forth by itself. We don't keep a, um, I mean, we know how God has to spread the word for us. We don't keep a mailing list. We don't put out any kind of information because our ministry is different. If it's a ministry, it's a serving ministry. It's to help you. And where God wants us, he's going to get us there through plan A, through plan B, through plan C, up, up to X, if we're not willing. We'd rather go plan A. And that's why we're here. Okay. You're going to find, as you move in intercession, that you're going to move mm -hmm. and see people who are down in the very lowest depths of hell. You'll, you, I remember one time when I cried out in the spirit, censored, censored, and I interceded. And I mean, I would cry out in desperation. Mm -hmm. And when you take up as an intercessor, you sense. And you know that the place this person is in, and you, you feel as if you're going to die, the hopelessness of it. And I won't go into that at this moment. But then God will also take you to walk with some of the people, the very top people of this land. Mm -hmm. I have ministered to people in high, high places. And love. You see... You go from one end of the spectrum to the other, and you never know where the Holy Spirit's going to take you. You don't know. But I have found this. I don't care if they have millions, maybe even billions. I don't know how much they have. They have so much. Or I don't care if that man is in prison or if they're doing drugs. Within each, every heart, there is that cry unto the Lord. Yes. There is a hunger that only he will satisfy. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, they dress differently, but when it all comes down into the one place, they all have the same need. I don't, it's the same need wherever you go. And God loves them. He's just as concerned about each one. There's, in God's sight, there's no discrimination. They all look the same to him, I know. Yes. More. You see, as you speak, you'd rather move into intercession and pray about things, but we got to speak. That's true. We'd rather pray than we would speak to you, but the Lord has directed us to help you. So you can enter and get the blessing. You do the work, you get the reward. You do. Uh, speaking of the lowest, um, we were uh, acquainted with a man who was a quite a heavy drinker, and he was a friend of my father's for many years. Uh, my father was not a Christian for many, many years. And he would go with his buddies, and they would play cards and, and drink and... and uh, the, uh, this particular man had a, had a real, a real bad habit. We hadn't seen him for many years. We knew of him and had heard through the relation that he wasn't doing well and so forth. And then we heard that he was in the veterans' hospital in a coma, not expected to live. And I know my mother, who was a wonderful prayer warrior, we would pray for him. One day I was in the kitchen where we used to live, and, uh, oh, I got this impression, oh, we had to go and see Charlie. Uh, you should care. Charlie was in a hospital. He'd been in a coma for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And they said, he, he, he won't come out of it. Mm -hmm. He won't mm -hmm. come out of it. Mm -hmm. But Fern and I, we knew him. Mm -hmm. I have talked with him on several occasions. And we prayed the prayer of agreement that God would save his soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's unconscious. Mm -hmm. No way anyone can reach him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Fern was in the kitchen. She became concerned about this. And I was out in the backyard. And suddenly, I, I walked towards the house. And she came out. And simultaneously, we both said, we got to go and see Charlie. Charlie, yeah. To go. Let's, let's, let's clean up now. And, and let's go out to the Veterans Hospital and, and see Charlie. Let's go out. So we did. We went out there. The nurse met us at the station. And she said, uh, 
Oh, well, she says he, he doesn't have any visitors. He is in a coma, and uh, he, if he's alive this minute, it's something. And so she turned to go and perform her other duties, and we were all alone there. His room, was, the door to his room was right here. There were about six beds in there, but everyone was empty and made up, except he was lying uh, uh, in a bed there. We kind of tiptoed in the room and uh, walked over to him, and I leaned way over to him, I suppose because I knew him because of the family, and I leaned way over to him, and in a, quite a loud voice, uh, I said, Charlie, I said, God loves you, and we love you. We came to tell you that God loves you so much today. Now, he's lying there, just as if his eyes are closed, and he looks as if he's dead. And I'm bending over him, and his eyes open right up at me, just opened up. And I was so startled, I looked right in his eyes, and I said, Charlie, do you know who I am? Now, I haven't, uh, how many years would you say I thought? Ten? Well, five would be a lot, too, too. I don't remember. It's a long time since we ever saw him. And I said, do you know who I am? And he said, yes. He spoke out in a weak voice, and he said, yes, you're Rudy's daughter, Fern. So he had his senses, didn't he? He had his senses. He had come alive at the voice of love. And Phil, knelt, uh, Phil came closer to him, and he said, he took his hand, and he said, don't exert yourself. We're just going to pray for you now. And he kept looking at us, blinking his eyes, with tears coming out of the corners of his eyes. And Phil prayed, Father, in Jesus' name, usher Charlie into your presence now that he'll know the forgiveness of sins and that he'll be right with Jesus in your presence. In Jesus' name. And we patted his hand and we started to tiptoe out of the room and we got a little bit away from his bed and we heard his voice. And he says, oh, oh, and he turned around and he was up on one elbow, very weak, you can imagine, very weak. And he said, oh, he says, uh, thanks a lot, folks. Now, my mother called us later and told us he died at 6 o'clock that night. So see, God knew somebody had to reach him. We got the reward. We got the reward. We got it. We got it. We got it. I'll tell you, see, you can do the same thing. God will impress you about people. Uh, we were impressed about some neighbors of ours. Now, our neighbors are very precious people to us. Wherever we move, we make acquaintance with our neighbors. Now, in our society we live in, you don't know who's in the next apartment. I don't know that you'd want to know. But God will let you know. God will let you, you know, there might be some people that uh, that you wouldn't. It's possible. See, and humanly speaking. But God will let you know the people he will lead you to to influence your neighborhood. We moved right across the bridge. Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota grow together. They're just across the street here in St. Paul. And so we moved across the line into St. Paul. And we moved. St. Paul is largely a Catholic city. Uh, and uh, we moved into a neighborhood where there are lots of, Catholic people, good, precious people. And we made our way. We were invited, first of all, to a big cocktail party. Uh, the neighbor on one side was given, called us, called us on the phone and said, were your neighbors to the right? He was an attorney. And he said, um, wh what is your name? We want you to come next Sunday to a cocktail party in your honor. The neighbors are going to be here and you want to meet everybody. And so, can I tell this? <laughs> oh, you heard it first here. And so I said to Philip, oh, I, I said, just a minute. I said to Philip, uh, honey, we're invited next door next Sunday at uh, 3 o'clock for a cocktail party. And um, Philip says, you know, like, we're not going. <laughs> and uh, so I said to him, oh, well, we'll be happy to go there. We'll, we'll be there. I did. I did. I did. I did. And uh, so, 
So we went over there. They greeted us at the door and introduced us all. And when we came in, there was a bar there, and it had all the bottles that you see on the signs, you know, it was all, all there laid out. And they said, you know, what do you have? And we said, well, let's see, if you got uh, Seven Up and Sprite and Coke, oh, yeah, yeah, we got all that stuff. What do you have? I said, well, I like Seven Up. And Phil says, well, I'll, I'll take Seven Up, too. Yeah, oh, sure. What do you want in it? We said, well, you know, we have the new wine. And they said, uh, well, oh, I think they thought maybe we'd ha that we had wine before we came or something. We did. We did. We did. We did. The heavenly wine. Jesus. We did. God set this whole thing up so we could fellowship with our neighbors, get acquainted with them. We had a good time with them. And Jesus came for us. He said, well, what kind of business are you in? And we said, well, uh, Phil told him of his, uh, the job that he had supervising a government dental laboratory. And he traveled around, set up other, other laboratories. And, uh, well, they thought that was interesting. And uh, how many children did we have? What did they do? You know, I suppose he wanted to know how much money do you have in the bank? Are you interested in stocks and bonds? One man was an insurance agent. If this tape gets back, well, you know, they know who they are. And he's wanting for fully covered with insurance, and we understand all that. But our message to them was, uh, you know, uh, the thing that we're caught up with is our job and everything, but Jesus has become so real to us, we, you know, we'd like to share him with you. And it got awfully quiet. <laughs> but I will say this, God used us in the 12 years, we're going back now to sell our house because we bought a house in Tulsa. We, God used us with every single family there. We had a neighbor whose uh, three sons were ministers, and she said, Fern, I've lived here. We built the house 55 years ago. I'm an old woman. We entertain a church. We have church people over. She says, I have never once opened my mouth to my neighbor. So see what a witness you can be? God wants us to get acquainted with our neighbors. Now, we've got a club going in the church, you know. We meet everybody that's like we are. And we have fellowship, and that's good. We need to do that. That's, that's the first thing, is to have fellowship with the believers and enter into that fellowship. But don't make it an exclusive club, but that's all you do. You go there to get fellowship, you get built up for what? To go home and look at television? No, uh -huh. it doesn't work that way. Feed you to feed other people. Praise yeah. God. Praise God. On the one side of us lived a, an older couple. They were up in their 80s. He was an atheist, forbid his children to go to church, and they sneaked off. He had two daughters, and they sneaked off to go to Sunday school when they were young. But he had nothing to do with God. But when I moved into the neighborhood, we became good friends. And he liked to come over and talk with me. He was a well-educated man. Oh, my. He knew so much, all these degrees and things. But, you know, we had a real good fellowship. And when the Lord dealt with me taking early retirement, when we'd be gone during the winter months, he'd watch my house and he'd take care of things. He would let no one else come near the place. He had the key, and boy, he watched it, and he called, and he talked. This, he took this upon himself to do when I was gone. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to go into all the details on some of these things. But you know, he was an atheist. Didn't believe in God or anything. But Fern, would, she likes to bake and entertain, and they'd come over, and we'd have, you know, some coffee and pie and things, make blueberry pie or rhubarb pie and all these good things. And... When they'd sit at our table, we would say, well, you know, we see grace when we eat. Well, they said, fine. So we'd take and hold hands. He was there, and I was here, and they were on each side. They know nothing about God, not a thing. I'd take their hands, and I would pray, dear Lord Jesus. I lift Ward and Marg up to you, up as well. And I ask you, Lord, that you'll forgive their sins.
cleanse their sins in your blood, dear Jesus. And Father, make Jesus real to them. And when I get through praying, they'd squeeze our hands. And I'd say to her in efforts, they squeezed my hand. She says, yeah, they squeezed mine too. And we decided God wanted us to know, because of course we had him on a prayer. Now, this didn't come through a prayer in the spirit. If you want to get the prayer in the spirit, you know, do what you can in the prayer in your understanding first. Pray in understanding and then pray in the spirit also. So praying for him in our understanding. And, the, and they would squeeze our hands. So we decided that we would say to each other, from here on in, we're going to treat them like believers because they have received something through us. They gave a certain amount of consent by by not saying, don't touch me. And when he said, the first time he said, well, I'm an atheist. And I said, oh, you mean you're a theist? <laughs> and he said, no, uh, no, no, no. He said, don't misunderstand me. I'm an atheist. I said, there is no such thing. There's no such thing as an atheist. I said, it's a theist. So I told him. Well, from there on in, of course, we were out in the yard occasionally. Not every day, but we'd be out in the yard doing something when we were in town. And they'd be in the yard, and we'd call them over and have lemonade. We were to their house and had cookies and coffee and whatever. Over the years, we became very close friends. I would have, uh, when I wanted to and had time, I discovered the birthdays of uh, five older couples, all in their 80s. They'd built their homes in this neighborhood, and they still live there. And we knew one day, you know, you don't live forever. They're all going to be in the same time element and pass on. So we really had them on our hearts. We knew God had them on his heart. So we would have birthday parties at our house, just cake. And I'd go to the bakery and buy a cake and make coffee and serve it and have a little something for them because most of their children lived in other states and couldn't even be with them. I thought, oh, God, if that was me, how nice. So put yourself in the place of others, and we'll prove to you how it comes out now in a minute. Over the years, we had the fellowship. When we were in uh, Dallas two years ago, over the winter, we spent the winters and traveled out of Dallas, we became so concerned about the Ingersoll thing, sort of. And we knew they were in, she was in frail health when we'd been home at Christmas. She was uh, in a hospital bed up in her bedroom and so forth. So we were impressed that we should go up in April, two years ago, and uh, we just we just wanted to get up with them. Do you remember? Uh, they, were, they had both been put into a nursing home, and uh, Marg had, after she found out what was wrong with her, she wouldn't talk to anyone. She just wanted to die, would speak to no one, hadn't spoken to anyone for several months. Ward, he found, they found a big tumor on his brain, and he didn't have long to live. We, we knew they were in a rest home, but we didn't know all these things. Mm -hmm. Our son told us about this because he would go to see them, and they would respond to him somewhat. Their one daughter had come to us from the West Coast, and she had been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and she heard we were Christians. She'd come over to our house one summer, and said, oh, I hope you can reach my folks. I'm not able to do anything. Well, we shared a little bit with her to encourage her the things that were transpiring. It's nice to encourage people what God's doing in their family. But we were in Texas, and God began to deal in my spirit. When I begin to pray in my spirit, in, in these words of wisdom and knowledge come, God directs me by his Holy Spirit. And I was going up to Minneapolis in just a couple of weeks, but God spoke to me. I had to go quickly. So we drove up. And... Uh, when we got up there, we went over to the nursing home. And uh, they were each in separate rooms. And first we went into her room and tell her mm -hmm. what happened. Yes, she was lying just like a china doll with her beautiful white hair. She was, never opened her eyes for four months. She'd eat a little food or get through too, but she never opened her eyes to look at the nurses. They told us that. And um, I walked over to her bed and I leaned over to her and I said, Marguerite. I said, it's Bernard Bill Halverson. We came to tell you we love you, and God loves you. And I, and I was right up against her, her ear. And she didn't open her eyes, but she raised her very frail arm, and she was here, and she raised it and put it around my neck and murmured something. And I said, Marguerite, we're just going to pray now that the angels of heaven will usher you into the Father's presence where there's fullness of joy and where the Savior of your sins 
is welcoming you with open arms to receive you unto himself. And I never prayed that with anybody except this Charlie in the hospital, sort of, you know. And it came to me to do that. And then we, we I leaned over and kissed her on the cheek, and we tiptoed out. There were two nurses that were going to be doing something for her. And we went around the corner and went into his room, and there he was lying all dressed up on top of his bed covers, and there was a man in, in the next bed. And he had his face turned around, and, um, and he appeared to be sleeping. And Phil leaned over to him, and he was... He, he was in a coma much of the time, I found out from one of his brothers. And that when we came there, he was in this coma, but we came in and called his name, and I prayed a little, and he came too. Mm -hmm. And he looked at us, and he says, well, well, Phil and Fern, he said. Mm -hmm. And so we prayed with him. We asked the Lord to come into his heart, to forgive his sins, and pray for him. And he, and he joined in with us. And then suddenly Satan just, this thing grabbed him and he was back into that unconsciousness. But I had prayed with him and he'd responded. And I knew we had, it had been done. So we left. And that, we left that evening for Texas. When we arrived in Texas, the phone was ringing. Mm -hmm. As we came in the door of our house. And it was their daughter calling from Seattle to tell us that the night that we were there, because she didn't even know we'd been there, the night that we had been there, at 12 o'clock midnight, they both passed in the presence of the Lord. We got two more. No, there's no such thing as an atheist. There is no such thing as an atheist. They were too proud to tell us they believed. We knew that. But see, God saw past the pride he saw that we could receive them as believers in that little tiny bit of faith. Praise the Lord. So we did obey the Spirit and go, and we got the reward. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, to just move into just a little different I area. Uh, I became involved in full gospel businessmen in St. Paul. About in 1971, the Lord dealt with me, and so I went ahead with it. The Lord dealt with me to buy a big home. I don't have time to tell you all about how I interceded. And we didn't know why we needed this big home. Much too big for us, but beautiful, lots of room. But God dealt with us to start the full gospel businessman's chapter in St. Paul in our home. And we would have businessmen come in twice a month, and Fern would make things to eat in between, and we had glorious fellowship. Many people came to know the Lord, many men, and we filled with the Holy Spirit, and we could share ex experiences for hours on just this area, but uh, we were also very much involved in church work. I mean, I would, we'd, it'd be from morning to late at night, and uh, you know, you can so, be so so involved in doing God's work and God's wanting to speak to you, but he, you cannot become quiet enough so he can speak. And I had been in service all day on a Sunday. I would have to be up early in the morning to go to work. And I knew all day and for some time, for several days, I knew God was the spirit of God was wanting to speak to me. I knew that. But I came home from at Sunday night service, and Fern went to bed, I went downstairs, and I knew I had to take time to be with the Lord. I went downstairs, built a fire in the fireplace, and uh, I'll just tell you how, how I prayed and what I did. I, it was in the spring of the year, it was cool, and I knew I might be there for some hours, and I wanted it to be warm. And as I sat down, I began to pray, and God dealt with me to Read one of Smith Wigglesworth books. And you know, on these, on these men that are filled with the Holy Spirit, there's an anointing even on the books they write. And as I was praying, the Spirit of the Lord came down, and I, I knew I was to go on one of these full gospel businessmen's airlifts. But I'd been putting it off, pushing it back, pushing it back. And God dealt with me that I, I would have to go. I would have to go. And then as I was praying in the Holy Spirit, the Lord began to speak to me, and he says, you're going to be sent. 
You're going to be sent. You're going to be sent. And he kept bringing this, bringing it in the spirit. But, you know, I really didn't know what that meant. I heard it, but I didn't know what does this mean to be sent. Praise God. You want to share a few things? Well, we got our ticket uh, to go. We got the passport and so forth. And it was late. We called Henry Carlson in Chicago and arranged that we, we, this was the last day you could make arrangements. And uh, we arrived in Copenhagen. Well, before that, at church, we had a prophecy given to us. Uh, a businessman had come into our church, been born again, and uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the gifts that come into operation is in this man. And he came up to me and he says, I, the Lord showed me a vision, Brother Halvers, and he says, I want you to judge this. But he says, I, I see you in a foreign land, he says, and you're talking through an interpreter. He says, while you're speaking, he says, there, it's a big church. And way in the back, he says, an old man gets up and he cries out for you, wants you to pray for his son that he hasn't seen for many years. And he says, you know, you're to minister to that man. Now, this is what God's showing me, but he says, I don't know what it means, and I just want you to judge it. Well, God had been speaking to me that I should go on his airlift, and that was one of the things that made me go home and really get down to, to praying about what to do. Mm -hmm. So we made the arrangements with Henry Carlson to go, and we drove to Chicago. And while we were in the airport there, I noticed this was back in 19, spring of 72. I noticed so many of what, in those days, we called them Jesus people coming in. And we had to be there several hours ahead of time. And they were coming in and coming in. And Fern and I were looking at these people. And it was a different experience. I had never seen them. You know, they were converted hippies. And they had the guitars. They had the floppy hats. They had the beads. They had everything on it. I wasn't used to seeing And I said, oh, Philip, thank God we're not going in a plane with those. <laughs> That's what I said. Anna, I did. That's what I said. And when we got on the plane, guess who was on the plane? Everyone. It's me. <laughs> they kept us awake all the way to Copenhagen. Fanatics. So many things happened, and I don't have time to say all of them, but while we were in Copenhagen, uh, Henry Carlson came to me, because when I called him, he said, where do you want to go? And I said, I would like to go to Norway because that's where my grandparents came from. Fine. And uh, I wanted to go to Sweden because my grandparents came from Sweden. Your mother came from Sweden. Yeah. Her, mother, her mother came from Sweden. Yeah. So, but he said, as he gathered there, he said, now, he said, Phil, you want to go to Norway? But he says, we are so burdened for Sweden. He says, I want to send you to Sweden. He says, I want to send you. And I stood there. Oh, how I wanted to go to Norway. But I said, I knew what God had spoken. I said, yes, Henry. I says, I'll go to Sweden. He was happy. Well, I'd have been happy, Norway. That was the Lord's will. I would have been happy. Guess who God loves best? We have lots of fun in, as we do this tension. You know, I mean, well, praise God. He's wonderful. We, we flew from Copenhagen to Stockholm. We went on a train inland, and there were many things that happened. The church we went to, they said they knew nothing about it. They heard full gospel of this, and then they were going to come. And then two, a Swedish man and a lady came driving up in these European cars. They're very fancy, beautiful cars. And they drive like maniacs. Uh, if you've been over there, you know what I'm talking about. And they took us down through the country. And they were, oh, how they, we drove for quite a ways. And we came to a little church out in the country. And as we came into this church, the service was in progress. And as we walked in and we're coming in, I looked up on the platform. And I saw two of these Jesus people that had been on our plane. There were two boys and a girl. wondering about this and I talked to them after the service and they, they told us they said we know we were praying in Copenhagen we'd been on the street witnessing and God talked to us and said we should go to Sweden 
They said two men came by in a car. They picked us up and they stopped the, they, they drove like mad, they said. They crossed over the water and into Sweden, drove uh, all day. Crossed over the water by ferry. Yeah. They said they, they never spoke English to us. They drove all day, and they brought us up, and they dropped us off at this little church in the country and said, we didn't know where we were. We had no idea until we saw you. And I knew why they were so happy to see us. <laughs> I, I often wondered who these two men were that took them up there. Angels. We know they were angels. Well, as we met with, uh, we had a team of a preacher, a singer, Philip and I played the piano, but um, no, there were, that. We didn't play the piano. yeah, I played the piano. And uh, then we had, uh, let's see, a preacher, a singer, Philip and I, and then uh, two Jesus people. So there were six in teams. They went all over Europe, you know. What did I say? Uh, they went all over Europe in teams. So this was our team to go to central, southern Sweden. And that's, of course, where we started. Then, just before the, the meeting was in progress, but we went behind to a little room to have a word of prayer together because some we hadn't met the preacher and the song leader yet, and we, we had a word of prayer. And the, the minister, uh, the young man that was to minister, was looked like he was uh, just having a nervous reaction of some type. And he said, oh, he said, I can't minister. He says, I've lost my Bible. And Philip says, well, here, you can take mine. And I says, you can have mine. And he says, no, 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 no. He says, I've got my notes in my Bible. I can't preach without my notes. And uh, so, and the song leader says, well, well, don't look at me. <laughs> and, of course, the Jesus people, kids, they, they just look blank. And I, I knew better than to say, you know, I could help out. So Philip was designated to be the preacher. Now, if we had known that, if he had known that before we went, I don't believe there would be too many things that could get us to go. But the Holy Spirit was in it. As we were in that service that night afterwards, there were three people who came up and wanted prayer for healing. Uh, and over there, you have to speak through an interpreter because you do not understand the language. I prayed with the first two. And then the interpreter walked off, and there was this man standing alone there. He could speak no English, and I couldn't speak Swedish. So, and he wanted, I knew he wanted prayer. I'd been instructed in this. So I put my arms around him, and I just prayed in the spirit for this man. He put his arms around me. And I didn't realize from then on that this man followed me very closely at my side the whole time I was there in these meetings in Sweden. We were, we were, housed in the home of a Baptist minister, spirit-filled Baptist minister, who pastored five small churches in Sweden. But this man was an organizer. He got us up early in the morning. We would go to at least two schools in the morning, or we would go to one school, maybe go into two different big classrooms, and they'd bring the students together. They wanted us to talk to them. He'd have two meetings in the morning. Then he'd have two in the afternoon. And then we started out with one at night. But this pastor realized if he worked it right, he could have an early evening service and a later evening service. Uh, God was with us and blessed. The young people came out in multitudes. And uh, Fern is blessed because she can sit down and she just hears a tune. She can sit at the piano and play it. And these, these young people came, and a man came and would lead them as a choir, and they would sing, and he would lead, and Fern would play the piano with, the, with them. And so wherever we went, this group of young people followed us. Well, they had a good opportunity to hear English and speak English that they'd learned in high school. And we knew that a lot of the attraction was because we were English and they had, or we were American, and they never had Americans in that territory. And God used that, of course, because the churches have uh, eight old people for one hour Sunday mornings only there with these beautiful cathedrals. But I want to tell you about a, remember the fellow that prophesied in our church to Philip about it, speaking to an interpreter and an old man? Well, we were in a, a service 
uh, Philip was right in the middle of speaking, and the man interrupted him way in the back. An old man stood there with his cap in his hand, and he cried and sobbed. It touched all of us. And uh, uh, the interpreter was telling us while he was talking what he was saying. He said, oh, I wish you would pray for my son. He's been gone from home for over 40 years. And he says, I'm soon to be with the Lord, and I want to see my son before I go. Well, we realized it was the Holy Spirit confirming to us we're in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and so Philip said, come, come. So, and several gathered around. We prayed. We believed the Lord. We asked God, show this man your love and send his son home. The last day we were in Stockholm, friends came to us, before we left, our friends came to us and said, did you hear about that old man in the church? Remember the church? Yes. His son came home. He called him the night before and said, I'm on my way, came on the train, and his son came home. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Remember, the power and demonstration of the Spirit is, of the Holy Spirit, is the manifestation of Jesus. You want power in your life, what for? For others. You want the demonstration to show and prove that you are a servant of the Most High God and God's ministry to the people you're touching. Praise God. We were in this home, and the, the Baptist minister, he could speak no English. His wife had taken English in high school, could speak a few words if she went along slowly. So our communication was, a lot of it was by sign language. And one day, he tried to communicate to us that we were going to go to a prison to minister. And they... But we, we finally gathered. He drew a picture with a, a, a man behind a window with bars and a face behind it. We knew it was a prison. And... Uh, we were invited to go to Kumla Prison in Sweden. It's their maximum security prison, underground prison. We were instructed as we went in that everything was electronically operated. We'd have so much time to minister, and then when certain bells rang, we would have to leave certain areas and move on out, or we'd be in there overnight. As we went into the prison, uh, and we're going, they, they said, we're going to have you minister on the psychiatric ward. Oh, I thought, God, psychiatric ward? I thought, we haven't had any experience at all with psychiatric people. They won't even know what we're talking about. I'm being honest with you now. This is exactly what I thought. I thought, how come? You know, I felt like this is we're in the wrong place. I honestly did. You see, your natural mind is programmed by what has been Mm -hmm. put into th into mm -hmm. this computer. Mm -hmm. But you see, in the things of the spirit, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. Mm -hmm. I know I had the same reaction as Fern had because we have worked with people that have problems and there's there's many times that you can work with people for months, it seems, and they're still, you know, they don't come in, into a complete deliverance for several reasons. But as we went in up into this room, we came into an upstairs area and we walked into a room, and there were about 17 men sitting at these chairs. And as I'd come down the hallway, I noticed on this side there were workrooms, workshops for them to do things. And as we walked into the room, there, were, there was our group, the interpreter, and uh, some prison officials and three psychiatrists in their white coats were standing there to observe this. And uh, I believe it was the assistant warden there with them. And as they, we came in there, we begin to sing some songs and praise the Lord. And then they said, Phil, it's time for you to share what the Lord, whatever the Lord's given to you. And I prayed and I said, Lord, what am I going to share? And I, uh, I realized us, what had happened in my life where God had led us to minister with someone in prison, their deliverance. And uh, so I began to share this. And while I was speaking, a, one of these, a big blonde Swedish fellow got up out of his chair and he started walking up, and he came walking towards me, and he came walking, and he came like this. And I was looking at the psychiatrist, and wondering, well, who's, you know, what's he going to do? 
And I just stood there, and he came up this close to me. And he said, I'd like to receive Jesus as my Savior in perfect English. I, I, I was just startled for a moment because I was, you know, a little apprehensive as he'd come up. But I, I said, fine. I said, come with me. And we went across the hall, and I read scripture with him and prayed with him. And he came into a glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ in his life, a real joy came into his spirit. You know, we were rejoicing in the Lord, and uh, Fern and some of the others, they came in, they said, Bill, come quickly, come quickly. And I came into the other room, and here were these men that had come with us, and here was a man demon-possessed. And they were over there, and the demons were talking to them. If you begin to deal in this area, don't talk to demons. This is not the thing to do. And there's scripture how to do things. But also learn to move in the realm of the spirit. Look into your spirit. What does God want to do? So I stood there and I just observed for a few minutes, praying within myself, Lord, what do I do? And you know, you sense that anointing of the Spirit of God when it comes. And usually Jesus spoke to demons. But I, I will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I, I have learned that's the thing to do. I walked over then laid my hand on this man and I began to pray in tongues. And the demons were talking began to speak to me, forgot about the other fellows. One, and I could hear what he was saying, different things, but I would not listen to him. I commanded him to be silent in the name of Jesus. And, but he got loud, and as he got loud, I got louder, and he got louder, and I got louder, and pretty soon it was a very loud place. I mean... I have never been louder in all my life. And the electric charges of the Holy Spirit that you noticed upon my husband, that charge of the Spirit was very evident. And then as I was praying, I, you see, you can sense in your spirit, you know things in your spirit. And suddenly this praying in the tongues, I realized this was over. And then I says, now in the name of Jesus. And when I said, in the name of Jesus, the demons cried out. They said, don't say that name, spell it. It's dangerous. And I commanded the demons in Jesus' name they would have to leave. And then they became very agitated. And they were, there was, conver I don't know if the others heard it, but in the spirit, or whatever realm it was in, I could hear them talking and they were saying, we've got to leave, we've got to go, but where are we going to go? And I commanded them in the name of Jesus to go to a desert part of the earth. They left the man, he slumped down, and he could speak no more English. I then had to speak to him through an interpreter. And then the bell rang. It was time for us to leave. As we were standing there, these different officials, they came and got the others. We're standing there like this. Yeah. They came and got the others. They took them one way. They came over and took Fern and I and the warden and this, uh, and they took us a different direction. Fern was very, quite nervous at this time. <laughs> well, three psychiatric doctors to take you up, you know, a separate way. We went into a different room, and they were talking and talking in Swedish there, and we were wondering what was going on. And then they brought the interpreter in and the pastor, and they said to us, we were in, in it, today as we were in here observing this, we've heard about the Pentecostal people. We've heard about this. We've heard of this power, but we've never seen it in, them in operation before, or what were the views? Uh, we've never seen it like this. We've never seen it, the Pentecostal power. Yeah. We've never seen it. But we have seen it today. And what we would like to do, we would like for you to bring all, the, we'll bring the prisoners in small groups, and we want you to minister to all of them.
when God speaks to you and tells you you're sent, you better believe there's when he sends you, you are sent. You have authority. And when you move under that ministry, we were sent out. Henry Carlson says, we're going to send you. And under the full businessmen, they were in charge. We were obedient to what they said. I was obedient to what the Spirit had spoken to me. And we moved in many services in such dramatic ways that it, uh, it seemed, there were times almost like you, you thought you'd gone to heaven. It was so wonderful, mm -hmm. the things we were seeing. The reception of the people was tremendous. The yeah. young people lined the aisles. I don't know if they had fire codes like they did here, but they just lined the aisles. The beautiful big uh, uh, altars with marble and, and everything back here was a sacred zone that nobody came in. The minister preaches off of a uh, uh, thing on the side that's been built up, so he's way above the people in authority, you know. And here they are. We're right down on their level, and uh, Philip is speaking to them, and, and they're so receptive. They've never heard anything like this before, and they come to Jesus. They come to Jesus for everything. They come for salvation. They come to Jesus for a release from their fears. They come to Jesus for healing. They come to him to have more of his spirit, and they come to him to go out and serve him. But they always come to Jesus, not to Amen. a man, but to Jesus. Amen. Amen. We had one day to ourselves the day before we were going to leave, and we said, oh, I know my husband's Norwegian. I thought, Lord, just let him get inside of the border there, and I know it will do something for him. Um, Norwegians are rather stubborn, and, of course, Swedes are just set in their ways. So I thought, I thought that if I, could, if I could just get him into Oslo, just over the border, He'd forget that, you know, I was in Sweden for 10 days. So we t we got tickets and we went over just for the day and, and back. And then we were going to leave the next day. And we just had the day. So uh, we made the journey over. They got into us on the train station. And, um, well, we didn't shop too much. We were just kind of looking around. We, of course, sent postcards to prove to all our friends we were there. And then we sat down with a sandwich or something we'd picked up uh, on a park bench. And... Uh, we addressed uh, all, well, all of them. We were getting ready to mail them. Of course, we we didn't know then that we had the wrong postage and nobody got the cards. <laughs> we we didn't know that. We put American post postage on, and uh, they don't. Norway doesn't look at that. But anyway, here uh, we were looking for a place, all stamped, ready to go to send these beautiful postcards. And Phil says, "Well, I wonder where there's a post office box. I haven't seen any." I said, "Well, we'll ask somebody." Now, all the young people over there speak very good English. We talked very loud and slow and made schools out of ourselves <laughs> because they do speak English, really. They apologize in perfect English for their bad English. So so uh, we saw a young man heading over. He had a bunch of books under his arm. He was tall and athletic looking, and he was kind of heading right where we were sitting. And uh, I felt I wanted to ask him a question about where to mail the I said, I said, could you tell me where there's a post office around here? We have some cards we'd like to mail back to the state. And as I inquired, he, and I said, in the name of Jesus. He went like that. I'll yeah. pretend I'm him now so yeah. he can tell you the story. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I said, and he said, when Phil asked him the question, he just went, Ooh. I'd say, in the name of Jesus. Speak. He said, um. There's a, and when Philip says, in the name of Jesus, speak, he said, right around the corner, you go down that little hill, and there's a post office box there. I'm laughing because they're laughing at me. Uh, and so every time I would ask him a question, he'd go, oh, and I would say, in the name of Jesus, he could speak. And then he would speak and answer us. But not until Philip says, in the name of Jesus, speak. Mm -hmm. But you know, as he realized what I was saying, and as I would ask him a question, he realized, he, he said the name Jesus. When he'd say that name, he could speak without this speech seemingly impediment. Mm -hmm. And then 
we told them how to receive Jesus as his Savior, explained the way of salvation. And I, I told them, I said, when you will receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you will have no more speech impediment. I realized what I was dealing with was a very low demon power that couldn't speak. All he would do, he was bound and he would uh, just moan kind of thing. We asked him, we, and he was kind of backing away from us because he had books under his arm. We said, Are you, do you live around here? And of course, the same thing, that loud, uh, shrill noise and called command him in the name of Jesus. And he said, I'm a student at the uh, uh, Oslo University. And Philip says, what are you studying? And, he, you know, same high tone, woo, and Philip's in the name of Jesus. Speak. And he said, I'm studying comparative religion to find out who the true God is. Yeah. See, we were at the right place at the right time, aren't we? You can be there, too. In intercessory prayer, the Lord will take you into so many different situations that it's uh, you just have to be led of the Lord in the area uh, uh, that he'll take you in. Um, the Lord led us to be with Vicki Jameson. She never called us, but the Spirit of the Lord led me to go and intercede for her. And we were down in the lower part of Louisiana. We'd been invited to come and dedicate a church. And there's quite a story behind it, but I don't have time to go into it. But this was a well, not this big, but it, it was a good-sized church. And they were all gathered for the dedication of the church on a Sunday afternoon. And Vicky had been invited to be the speaker. Vicky had gotten up and was beginning to speak when suddenly she just bowed her head down. She turned around. She says, Phil, come and pray. I got up. And you know, the, 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 the anointing of the Holy Spirit, as you walk with the Holy the Lord, that, there's an anointing that abides within you. And learn to move in that anointing. And as I stood up there, I would call out the name of the city we were in, in the English language, and then I would pray in a tongue. I would call out the name of the city we were in, I'd pray in a tongue. And then as I felt this prayer lift after I had done this maybe eight, ten times, I went and sat down, and the service continued. Well, you see, nobody knew what was happening there. Vicki had sensed it in the spirit. She knew. After the service was over and most everyone had gone home, I was aware I was up on the platform picking up some of the PA equipment and different things we were had there. I was aware of a, a lady who's quite short and also kind of, you know, and she was in the back of the auditorium. She got the pastor, and then she got the assistant pastor, and she was agitated. She was mad. And I thought, well, someone's, you know, parked in front of her car, and she's not able to get out, and she said to sit there a long time, and she's, this has provoked her. But as she got the pastor and assistant pastor, I saw her start coming down the aisle, and when she got about right there, she pointed to me, and she says, that's the man right there. And I was wondering, what is this? And she walked up, she says, tell me what's happening to me. And I said, what is happening to you? You tell me. She looked at the pastor and assistant pastor. She says, that's the man right there. She says, you tell me what's happening to me. And I had to question her. She said, today when you got up and prayed, I heard you call out the name of our city. And then she says, I heard in one ear a language you were speaking that I didn't know. In the other ear, I heard in the English language what you were saying. She said, you were calling out this name of our city. And you were telling them to repent. This was the hour of God's visitation. And she looked at me, she says, tell me what's happening to me. And the pastor took her hand and she walked slowly out the door. And as she was leaving, I... The only thing that went through my mind, and I said it out loud, I says, I've never seen the Lord do it like that before. Not here in one ear and then no understand the other. We didn't know this, but it was told to us then by the pastor. This woman that came in was a very good Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher in the area, and not understanding the work of God, 
she had bought that church to the nail. Every time she knew anybody that went there, especially if it was a woman preacher or there was any kind of tongues, she would get them aside, tell all our neighbors, don't go there, it's of the devil. And she had been tricked into coming uh, oh, by... Uh, she stood there that night and she she invited us out to dinner three years later and she told us all these things and then it, I understood. She smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. And what had happened when she had come back in, She her, it wasn't her car that had been blocked. People had brought her to the church and as they were going home, she had a beautiful cigarette case. It had disappeared. She had been in the service and heard all these things. And she, uh, it had really shaken her up and she was, didn't know what to think. She says, take me back to church. She says, I got to see that man. And she'd come up and want to know what was happening and I didn't know what to tell her. I didn't understand what was happening. Two days later, we were in a home having a dinner with a man in the area who was at a television station. And while we were there, she called and she was talking to him and she says, you know, I'm at home. She says, I don't dare to do anything. She says, I'm trying to understand what's happening to me. She says, I lost my cigarette case and I haven't smoked since. She says, I'm afraid to smoke. She came into that service and the late, uh, uh, the later service uh, the next day and the, the lady that was with her came down to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and this lady came down with her, and when this lady was filled with the Holy Spirit, she had the same experience of hearing in one ear of that the Holy Spirit speaking, and in the other ear, hearing the English language. She was a very sick woman. I won't go into all the details, but she wouldn't have lived long unless God had intervened for her. Trigger diabetes, operation, several operations on her back, a fusing uh, vertebrae together. And uh, she came for to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was in the room and prayed with them. And as I came by, I heard her singing in a language. She was singing in the tongue. Uh, we were down in what they call Cajun country. And so I just walked over and prayed with the others. And then I, through praying with the others, I came back and I called her by name. And I said, do you speak any other language other than English? And she says, no, I don't. Well, I said, I hear you praying or singing in a language I do not understand. She looked at me. She says, I am. Didn't even know it. Didn't know. Then I laid my hands on her. I says, Lord, fill her with the Holy Spirit. And I mean, she hit a gusher. And she became drunk in the spirit. And she was walking, holding onto railings and walking out. She says, I got to go and tell Vicki about this. And then I found out as I talked to the, the, the assistant pastor was telling me, he said, she's been like Saul of Tarsus ever since we started this church two years ago. He says, we have prayed and prayed and prayed for her, but nothing has happened. The day of this opening dedication service, she had been tricked into coming there by her neighbor who went to the church. And she was sitting there, and when she realized she'd come into a church, she didn't believe in women preachers. And when Vicki got up to minister, she says, I've been tricked. She says, I'm going to leave. And as she went to get up to leave, Vicki said, Phil, come and pray. And God apprehended her. And God dealt with that one who had, had been such a thorn in the side of that church. There was a complete deliverance. Three years later, we were down there when Vicki flew in for her ordination service, and she was ordained into the ministry. Now, now she are one. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. We're in the right place at the right time. God's always in the right place at the right time. We're not always so ready to receive. We want to share with you now today the things that have happened to us. We, they happen all the time. We could be here quite a while and tell you things, but we'll tell you this is one thing in closing, two things. Uh, the Lord very seldom speaks to us about our own personal things. It's always somebody else. We find out later we have no knowledge of it, and God uses us that way to help the body of Christ. But 
we were at the opening of Vicky's Television to Rhonda Fair when she had the first week, and we stayed with her in her, in her uh, home. She just moved in with boxes and all. We were there Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. And uh, we were going right back to St. Paul, Minnesota. We had things up there and meetings we were going to be going to. I said to Philip when we went to bed that night, I said, oh, there's just beautiful people helping Vicki now. They've just come. The Lord has sent them to her to help her and with her set decoration and to know the backgrounds and colors. And it's just beautiful what's happened to Vicki. But I said, oh, I wish I knew what to tell these people. They're all asking us all the time when we're going to move to Tulsa. And we've explained to them, number one, you know, we're not called to Tulsa. Number two, it's not our television program. Number three, we're five hours away. If you need us for anything, you know, we can run up overnight or two nights or whatever. And uh, so uh, we don't have a burden for Tulsa or that. We're, we have a little home in, uh, in Dallas. It's a small little house that we use over the winter months to get out of the cold. And uh, so uh, unless the Lord, you know, would arrange the stars and say, Phil and Fern move to Tulsa, why well, I said, you know, there's no reason for us to move to Tulsa. And that's how we, I said to people, now, God didn't rearrange the stars, but what he did to impress us, um, and I said to one, he wouldn't even have to spell the name out, you know, just initial to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were in the car, uh, uh, I'll see, that was Friday morning to pick up some dry cleaning. We were praising Lord in the car for all the beautiful things that were happening to Vicki Jameson. And uh, on the way back, the Holy Spirit, he had his way to say things to us, and he spoke out this way in English. You must move to Tulsa. You must move to Tulsa. You must move to Tulsa. And we looked at each other, and we said, oh, we have to move to Tulsa. Now, I guarantee you, if God had said, you have to move to Iceland, we'd pack up and go, because we knew it was God. We feared the, the holy fear of God is too much to disobey when you know he's speaking to you. He doesn't have to speak in an audible voice, and he usually doesn't at Ooh. first. He gives you impressions. This is how you're going to know to move in the spirit, an impression you can't get away from, or maybe sometimes just a slight impression. Uh, try it out. Act on it. Try it out. See, you know. He says, oh, there's a needy person. Try it out. See what happens. Follow it along. We can tell you, people, God gets involved with people. It isn't just saying, bless you. You get involved with them. The couple we met in the grocery store, we're having them over to our home when we get back and can arrange a time. We want them to come and eat with us and sit down and find out more about them first and not just give them the gospel. We want to show them we are the gospel. Okay, a lot of you need to do this. And we pray that you will. And I know you have a desire now, having heard how the Lord will move, and you will. This we told Vicky about it when we came back to her home, and um, there was a lot of crying and praising the Lord and everything there. And we said, Vicky, we have to go right away to Dallas tomorrow and put our little house up for sale down there. Of course, we have our main home in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. This is a little tiny house, and we said we want to go right away down to. Uh, Dallas and put this house on the market immediately because you find a big secret if God speaks to you and you know it's God. Act right away and then he can bring those forces because he's got a right time there, you know. It's a little time zone for you to move in. So uh, we went to Dallas to make a long story short. We went there. I told our two neighbors on each side of us, a young attorney uh, and a, an older lady here, that we're going to sell our house, and after a lot of talk, oh dear, you're going to move, and they're lovely neighbors to us, uh, Baptist people, and we just loved them, and they loved us, and did our law enforcement, we were gone, and thought they were, you know, doing it for the Lord, which they were. Uh, uh, let's see, we got there uh, the next day, and we stayed overnight, and, you know, that day that we got there, we were out in the yard uh, raking up a few leaves and making it look neat, and when we were in the backyard, a lady came around the side of the house, and she said, uh, I hear your house is for sale. And we said, yes. And she said, I heard from Mabel. And we said, well, uh, she says, I'd like to see it. What do you want for it? We told her. Uh, and uh, she, uh, we said, well, just go ahead and go in. I thought I had everything in order, you know. And so I said, well, just go in. You can open the closet doors and, and look the house over and help yourself. We're just going to finish out here. And she came out the back door, and here's what she said. 
She said, my uncle died two years ago, and his estate was just settled six weeks ago, and I'm the only living heir. And she said, I like your house, and I want to buy it. And I have the money sitting in the bank. And she says, any time you get the papers together, she says, I like your house real well, and I want to buy it. That is what we call the Book of Acts coming to life in in your lifetime, in your time period. Make it happen. You can make it happen. God's waiting. He's been waiting so long for you to say, Father, that's me. I want to do I want to do your will that way. Let's stand up and worship the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Sandora sister in the under. Hallelujah. Solo, solo. Hallelujah. Solo, solo. Loose, use, use. Lanama sister under Hallelujah. Sister in the lady under Lasu, lasu. You, you. Yeah. Do Rama sasa. Isa, aso, so, so. Azi. Abazisto. Under a varite. Parisisti stendiri. Isa, ha, ha. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Loose it, loose it, loose it. Use it, use it. Amen. 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 So go revi hitara. Suster in the lady asasta Lead, no, 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 don't lead, don't lead, don't lead, no, 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 you're not to lead yet, no, no, oh, no, 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 saha, no, 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 nay, 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 all the basis they handle, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, ministries, ministries, yeah, the ministries, laha, yeah, yeah, saha, yeah, yeah, there are the ministries now, now there are ministries, yes, do the basita, do belilito sustoranda, Hallelujah, hallelujah, ministry, ministry. Yeah, 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 there's ministry. Saha, yeah, 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 so say, yeah, yeah, so say, yeah, so bodo day, day, this day, this is the day. This is the day. This is the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day. God is going to, there are going to be ministries of worship and intercessory prayer. It's going to be a flowing our pastors and the intercessors together. This it, It's so big, this thing. Awesome. But I'm going to just in short while, I want everybody that if we can gather around here, we're going to pray. I want you to come up here because God's going to bring you to flow together. And I want intercessors and pastors know to come and we're going to pray with you. For God's going to pour out of his spirit. But there's going to be Gifts of God's Spirit, He's going to give you in the intercessory ministry. For you see, we have just, we've been sharing experiences, and you've got to move into them. You've got to move into it. Yes, you've got to move into it.
in a moment. God has been speaking to Rachel and also to me. There's a little lady, her name is Dr. Berkey. She was an associate, was brought up under Sister Amy Simple McPherson. She's an old timer and she's taught us lots of things. You can learn from the old timers. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, she was die. she died once. And the Lord Jesus Christ took her in a vision after she was brought back and spoke to her about the things he wanted her to do and a ministry he wanted her to have. And he took her into a maternity hospital. And in the maternity hospital, there were many, many, many mothers lying there in pain. And the doctors were off over in a corner kind of laughing and joking. And they were not paying any attention to the mothers. And Jesus took her into this place and he said, these mothers represent ministries that are in the earth that I've placed. If I've placed a ministry, it should come forth. He said, there are many ministries and people that I've placed which have never come forth. Now he said, those doctors over there represent ministries other ministers who are already in the ministry, and, and, and this is not all ministers, I'm not talking about all, but some, they don't care if they come forth or not. And so they're not attending to these other ministries. And he said, in the last days, there are going to come those who have a gift from me, like a spiritual midwife, to release ministries in the earth. Hallelujah. Now, the Lord spoke to Rachel and said, every one of you can receive if you will receive. And if God has placed something in you, a ministry to be birthed, and he's spoken to our brother about it, and he wants it to come forth. So I'm impressed to the Spirit of God to have you place your hands on your tummy. Oh, hallelujah. Ministries come forth in the name of Jesus to the glory of God for his work in the earth.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I'm impressed to speak of you just momentarily. Just momentarily. When we were led by Mrs. Halverson a moment ago in a prayer of dedication, God heard it. And he has birthed in you some holy things and wondrous things. He does want to, he does want me to admonish you that you are not your own. You are bought with a price. And when the vessels in the Old Testament were dedicated to the Lord, they were not to be used for other purposes. They were his. I'm admonished to tell you right now to forget about your ministry. Don't call it your ministry. Don't take a braggadocious idea. Don't flaunt it. But just know that you're his and let him use you any way he wants to. There will come new realms, new places to walk in. And as you begin to enter the high and holier places of God, you will walk in a degree of God hitherto unknown to you. And things which were of little import in times past, you won't last if you persist in holding on to them. It is no light thing, Esther knew, to come into the presence of the king. Great and awesome work must be done, and the power you must operate in is directly from the Father through the Son. Holy vessels, great power will surge through. Records in heaven indicate what has happened to you in these days. You are a blessed people, a taught people, but a responsible people. I missed that. I should have said a responsible host. First means army. Those things held in high regard of you one week past, you must now let go. Your life I have called as a fast unto me. Fast the world. And you will see lightnings of God unfurl through thee. Insist on holding on. The power will go. And you'll be a lifeless one. But we'll see you so. I called you here. Everyone. I spoke to your heart. 
and you decided to come. In many meetings, folks are coerced to be there. Wives have begged husbands to come fill a chair. Not so in this meeting. I spoke to each one. Some won't admit it, but I told you, come. Not all were obedient, and they'll have another chance. But you came and opened and said unto me, Father, here am I, use me. Now I'm going to use you. Oh, all the powers at heaven's command, uh, I desire to loose throughout the land. I wait on the operation of your will before your vessel I fill with such power. If you stand here, heaven records you as having given witness in the earth, you are at my command. False witness is abominable unto me. So if you stand where others can see, I hold you to honesty before me. Lay down. Television. Lay down crafts. Lay down those things which to you would be a fast. Make sacrifice of what you love most to do. And see if I don't blow through you. Some of your yards won't be quite as beautiful this year. Some of you won't be so up on the fashions, which you love so dear. Other things will be harder to let go You won't be able to rock that little baby, your grandchild, as often as you'd like to, you know. Now, that's not the mothers, that was the grandmothers. <laughs> 